We are continuing our study of Matthew today in Matthew 5, 1 through 12. The title of the sermon is Attitude Adjustment. Have you ever needed one of those? You've probably had a few from your parents or someone else, maybe your spouse or your friends or your pastor. I don't know. <laughs> but our culture believes in attitude adjustments in a different kind of way than we should. You know, positivity is heralded as the, the solution to many social ills, right? So are you morbidly obese? Well, you just, you need to be body positive, right? Are, uh, are you a boy who thinks he's a girl? You don't need guidance and direction and, you know, truth to sort out that confusion. You just need to embrace your delusion, right? Are you uh, tired of being weighed down with antiquated morals on sexuality? Well, you know what you need. You just need to be sex positive. Are, does your child struggle with being a normal six-year-old that wants to play and doesn't have this giant attention span? Well, then you just need a better prescription, right? Because that, that's the other solution to the social ills in our culture, drugs. Well, all right, so not just any attitude adjustment will do for us. It doesn't always solve our problems. If we are all on a plane together and we look outside the windows and all of a sudden both of the wings break off and we start plummeting for certain death towards the ground and I look over and you're scared, you're, you're freaking out, you know, you're worried, and I say, hey, you just need to be plane crash positive. Well, that's not going to fix the problem. We might be able to figure out a way for you to feel a little bit better on your way to your demise, but it doesn't solve the whole demise issue. However, that's not to say that we don't need attitude adjustments because we absolutely do. We all know that we do, but the right attitude is not just whatever attitude makes you feel good. And so in order for us to understand the right attitude that we need to carry in any given situation, we should go to the one who determines what is right and wrong. So we go to Jesus Christ, and he comes to teach us the attitudes that his followers should carry, which we know as the Beatitudes, which is what we're studying today. Now, those attitudes that I was just talking about that the world promotes, I call those the me attitudes. We need to reject the me attitudes and instead embrace the be attitudes. And I hope that that's what we'll do this morning. And God, we just ask you to be with us. Help us to study this well. Help us to understand it. There's a lot of themes that we're going to be learning about through this sermon. But help us to take away what you are really trying to drill into our hearts and our minds. And that may be different for, for any one of us. But we open ourselves up to you. In Christ's name, amen. So we're going to start just with verses 1 and 2 of chapter 5 in Matthew. i got to turn this on. I'm not getting it, Brennan. No? No? Nope. There we go. All right. When he saw the crowds, that's Jesus, he went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to teach them. So there's a few contextual things that I want to get done with at the beginning. Matthew says Jesus went up on the mountain, but there's a, a lot of mystery as to the exact setting of this sermon. Uh, actually, in Luke 6, Luke records a series of blessings and woes that sound an awful like a lot like the Beatitudes from Matthew 5. But in Luke 6, he says that Jesus went down and stood on a level place. Of course, those two don't have to be contradictory. Jesus could have come down to a level place that's on the mountain. But at the same time, there's also like a lot of disagreement as to whether Matthew 5 and Luke 6 are even referencing the same situation, the same instance of teaching. And we don't know exactly where Jesus was or how it looked when he was teaching, but the imagery, there is something about the imagery of him going up on the mountain that could tie into the connection that we've already seen, how Jesus is the new and better Moses, 
And it reminds us maybe of Moses going up on Mount Sinai to receive the word of God, the Ten Commandments. And now this is not Mount Sinai, but Jesus is now going up the mountain to give the word of God and others are receiving the word of God. I don't know if there's necessarily a connection there or not, but it it definitely could take us in that direction. Our minds could go there. But Jesus' audience here is the disciples. We know that the crowds are around, but it says he went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him, and then he began to teach them. And as we will see, the message of the Sermon on the Mount is for people who truly want to follow Jesus. It doesn't work if you don't want to follow Christ fully and completely. You know, it's not just a nice moral teaching that Jesus intended for the world to pick and choose from as long as it makes for a a more functional and civil society. That is not the way that Jesus, even though the world wants to take Jesus' words that way and say, oh yeah, well, I like that that Jesus said this and I'm going to live by that or I'm going to repeat that, but I don't like that he said this, so I'm going to reject that. He never intended for his words to be taken that way. For us to pick and choose. The Sermon on the Mount has a lot of moral teaching in it. There's no doubt that's true. But it's it only works for those who recognize who Christ is, who recognize his authority, his power, and want to follow him as their Savior and Lord. Jesus isn't some moral guru that got some things right and some things wrong. He is the creator of the universe who holds the keys of heaven in his hands and judges the world based on their relationship with him. So we need to remember that anytime that we're looking at God's word and the teachings that we're going to be studying for several weeks in the Sermon on the Mount. So now what I want to do is I want to read the rest of the passage and and cover a couple of other things, and then we will walk through each beatitude one by one. So in verse 3, he says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the humble, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, For they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. For the kingdom of heaven is theirs. You are blessed when they insult you and persecute you falsely. Persecute you and falsely say every kind of evil against you because of me. Be glad and rejoice because your reward in heaven is great. For that is how they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So first of all. I want to deal with what it actually means to be blessed. If we read all of these Beatitudes and we don't understand that word blessed, then we're going to have a hard time properly understanding this passage. If you search hashtag blessed on social media, you're going to see all kinds of things, right? You're going to see people talking about and posting pictures about their families, their CrossFit classes, the, you know, the food they eat, nights out with their friends, their new truck or a promotion at work and everything in between. It is a muddied word in our modern vernacular. And we don't want to carry the culture's definitions of anything into the Bible and inject unnatural meanings. So this isn't being blessed. It's not about having good luck. It's not about having fortune. It's not about feeling happy. R.T. France, a commentator, said that happy has two psychological a connotation. It's not about feelings. If it were, then blessed are those who, like happy are those who mourn, would be awfully confusing because you're mourning. However, you could say it could be about being in a happy situation. Again, not in an immediate sense because we mourn, we're persecuted, but to be in a happy situation situation in general because of one standing with God. France says that fortunate comes a little closer to the meaning, but that also evokes thoughts of luck. We definitely don't want that. Congratulations to isn't bad, but it's a little unnatural for our normal speech. Congrats to the poor in spirit. Might sound a little weird if we translated it that way. Uh, He said that a more accurate way of translating blessed in modern times would be the Australian idiom, 
good on you. But that's not very helpful for us in our setting. And what was interesting, I thought this was interesting, the Welsh translation, the actual translation here in Welsh for blessed is, I don't know how you pronounce it in Welsh, but it's Gwyn Obed, which means white is their world. And it's an idiom for those for whom everything is good. Now you're like, well, what are you getting at here, Matt? Well, I'm getting at the fact that when Jesus talks about being blessed, he's not talking about a current circumstance or a fleeting feeling. As we see, he's talking about those who have, he's talking to those who have moved from death into life, right? Who will one day stand before their judge and hear, well done, good and faithful servant, welcome home. See, to be blessed is to be in right standing with God. That's what it means to be blessed. That's why Jesus can say that you are blessed even when you're persecuted. Even though you might not feel it at the moment, or you might not understand what that looks like, but it is real. The reality is, even when you're persecuted, you are blessed because you are in right standing with God. And the way that I interpret this passage is that there are eight Beatitudes, okay? And, and so verses 11 and 12 are like an extension of thought from the eighth Beatitude in verse 10 about persecution. And so what we see, we might notice that the first and the last Beatitude, verse 3 and verse 10, are worded a little differently in the second half because they say the kingdom of heaven is theirs. And then the six that are sandwiched in between those, the second half has a future tense, right? They will be comforted. They will inherit. They will see God and so on. And that connects with something that I taught also in this series not long ago about how the kingdom of God has an already but not yet aspect to it. Is it here or is it coming? And the answer is yes. It's both. The Christians enjoy benefits of being part of God's kingdom right now, but there's also future fulfillments that we are looking forward to. We can see the already not yet aspect in many of these. We are comforted now. You are comforted, but one day your comfort will be full. It will be complete. We are filled now in terms of being filled with righteousness. We're being sanctified by the Holy Spirit now, but one day we will be fully filled with righteousness, fully sanctified. We are shown mercy now, but one day that mercy will be complete. We are already sons of God, but you remember that one day Jesus is going to stand before the Father and vouch for us. And a couple of these seem to be even more emphasis on the future. We will inherit the earth, the new earth one day, our final resting place for eternity. And one day we get to see God in all of his glory. So we understand that there is a future aspect to this, but I also want you to notice that the blessing is current. Like even though most of the time in these verses, except the first and the last, it says they will be in the second half, but look at the first half again. It doesn't say blessed will be, it says blessed are. So blessing is both current and future. If you are in Christ, if you have repented of your sins and you walk in Christ, you are blessed now. You are blessed. You're in right standing with God. But one day you will understand and experience that blessing completely, fully. We look forward to that day. That helps us keep our eyes on the prize, right? And not focus on what do I feel right now? What do I have or not have right now? We're supposed to keep our eyes on the eternal things. And that, that we need to be reminded of that a lot. Like, not to focus on what, what do I own here? What am I going to inherit here? Leslie and I, our family, we live in a, a very, it's a nice neighborhood that we live in, you know, in, in the South Hills. And we like to go take walks around the neighborhood. And that can be a little disheartening sometimes because you, you walk around and you see these houses and you, you know, like, these are so expensive. I mean, we couldn't even come close to affording anything like this. And so you walk around and you kind of admire the houses and things. And then you're like, oh, I wonder what that's worth. And you go on Zillow and you're like, oh, my gosh. And 
And then if you really want to get down, what you do is you say, I wonder what that sold for five years ago or 10 years ago. And you're like, ah, you know, but it can be disheartening to do that. But it, here's the thing that's comforting that we have to keep reminding ourselves is like my father's house has many rooms. And one is prepared for me. And it's a sure thing. It doesn't matter. There's no housing shortage in my father's house. There's no interest rates in my father's house. There's nothing that's going to get in the way of that. And so that is a comforting thought. And that is when we think about being blessed. Yeah, it's now. But we're also looking forward to all of these things that we just read. And now I want to walk through them one by one. Verse 3, blessed are the poor in spirit, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. The poor in spirit. So what is this? What, what is it not? It's not depressed people. That's not the poor in spirit. It's not sore losers. Even though they are poor spirits, that's not the poor in spirit. And I can be a sore loser, but I, that's not talking to me here. It's not about being financially poor. That's not what this is. Now, just because you are poor does not put you in right standing with God. Although we do know that being financially poor often opens up more doors. People are more likely to put their trust and depend on the Lord instead of depending on themselves. But the poor in spirit, rather, are those who recognize that they are spiritually poor. It's that simple. Right? They are not those who believe they are good. And I've said this a lot at funerals, and I think I've probably even said it at a sermon here before. But, you know, it's easy to say or believe that you are good, but people leave out a really important word often. Enough. Are you good? Enough. People say that I'm good at basketball, but I am not good enough to make my living in the NBA. So you might say that you are a good person. And here's the thing, you're not, because those don't exist other than after we've been given Christ's righteousness, we are made good through him. But if you think outside of that, oh, no, I'm, I'm pretty much a good person. Well, you, you got to ask yourself, are you good enough? Are you good enough to save yourself? Are you good enough to be a child of God? Are you good enough to pay a debt that you don't understand against a God that you cannot comprehend? The answer is no. You're not. That's why you have to be spiritually poor. That's why you have to rid yourself of the thinking, of that kind of thinking, and transition from being like the Pharisee and instead become like the tax collector in the story in Luke 18, verses 9 through 14. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people. Robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all that I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but be his breast and said, God have mercy on me, a sinner. And I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. See, that's what it looks like to be poor in spirit. Not to sit on your soapbox and say, God, I thank you that I am not like the rioters or the communists or whoever else. But to say, God, I have nothing to offer. I have nothing that I could possibly give you. You have to recognize that you are spiritually broke. Your spiritual bank account is absolutely 
empty. You have nothing to offer to God and must rely completely on His grace. That's what it means to be spiritually, to be poor in spirit. Verse 4 says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Now, everybody in the world mourns, don't they? So does that mean that everyone is blessed according to the way that Jesus is using that word? No. Not everyone in the world is going to be welcomed into the comfort, the eternal comfort of the Heavenly Father. So what does this mean? Well, I love how it connects well with being poor in spirit. You see, there are many people, and I would say the majority of people in the world, who don't recognize their spiritual poverty. Right? I mean, they, they recognize that there's something wrong in the world, but they would think, if there is a God, and if there is a heaven, then I'm going to be there, because generally I'm a good person. And that's what people think. So they're not poor in spirit. But there's another group of people who are a little different. They recognize their evil. They recognize that they are spiritually bankrupt, and they don't care. They know that they're evil. They know that they're not good, but it does not bother them. Maybe you've heard people make statements like, oh, I'm going to hell anyway, so... And then that, that's what they say before they do something that they know is wrong. Because, you know, they want to do it. They know it's wrong. They don't care. And... To be in right standing with God, you must recognize your sins. You must recognize that you are spiritually poor. But also to be in right standing with God, you need to mourn your sins. You need to be broken by your sins. That's why the tax collector kept his head down and he just begged for mercy. He cared about his sin. He grieved his sin. And those who mourn their sins can be comforted by the grace of God. And I do believe that there's an even broader application here. that it, it doesn't just apply to mourning our own personal sins, but also the sins in the world. And one day we will be comforted whenever sin is completely removed from the creation that we dwell in. in verse 5 says, Blessed are the humble, for they will inherit the earth. Uh, this translation says humble. Some of you may be reading a different one that says meek. It's another common translation, but the idea is the same. It's of a person who makes themselves low. All right, like in Luke 18 that we just read, Jesus said that those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Jesus would also tell his disciples that the first would become last and the last would become first. So winning, and, and when it comes to eternal competition, spiritual competition, if you want to win, you got to come in last place. That's how that works. You've got to put yourself in last place. Michael Green said it this way. It says that victory goes not to the wise or to the strong, but to those who are so small before God, which is what meek means, that God can afford to exalt them without the danger of their getting proud. And the disciples would need to meditate on this beatitude later on when they were all arguing about which one of them was the greatest. <laughs> they needed to think back. Oh, wait, we might have a problem here. But that might also explain why so many things needed to happen in their lives to keep making them lower and lower and lower. Like, you guys probably know who became like the leader of the disciples. Peter. And, well, okay, so let's think about what happened in Peter's life. Peter was one in the group that tried to keep children away from Jesus, to which they were rebuked for that. Uh, Peter started to walk on water, but lost his faith in the middle of that, to which Jesus came up to him and said, Ye of little faith. Peter was in the group of the disciples that were arguing about which one of them was the greatest, to which they were rebuked. You remember that time that Peter rebuked Jesus? Yeah, that was in Mark uh, 8.32. Then Peter took him, Jesus, aside and began to rebuke him. And how does Jesus respond? Well, when he had turned around and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of men. <laughs> That's the worst rebuke that we've seen anywhere. Peter fell asleep three times and was rebuked by Jesus three times when he was falling asleep and said that he should have been staying awake while Jesus was praying. 
And you remember, oh wait, there was that time when Peter denied Jesus three times after he said that, oh, I'll never do anything like that. He was so confident in himself. Then he denied Jesus three times. And even after all that, later on, Paul publicly rebuked Peter because he was given into peer pressure. So the leader of the disciples is the one that we see being rebuked the most in Scripture. And why is that? Because he needed to be brought low so that he could be exalted without pride getting in the way. The pride had to be beaten out of him, basically. And that's the way it can be. We need to be humble. We need to realize that we are nothing, that we have nothing, and make ourselves low. See, you have a choice if you want to follow Jesus. You can make yourself low, or you can be made low. And we know that it's, the reality is it's a mixture of both in our lives, but I highly recommend making a strong effort to make yourself low so that you don't have to go through the pain that is involved of being made low, like Peter had to go through. And, of course, I mean, we could go through all kinds of stories. The other disciples had to go through many of the same kinds of things. But verse 6 says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Now, this isn't those who hunger and thirst for revenge, as much as we would like that, nor it is those who hunger and thirst for right laws. I mean, we we want right laws. It's great to have good laws, but uh, you can have right laws in a world that is still full of evil, and that's not what we're hungering and thirsting for. But those who do recognize their spiritual poverty, who do mourn their sins and the sins of the world, and don't see themselves as being above everyone else, will inevitably hunger and thirst for righteousness. They have a strong desire to see continued sanctification in their own lives, but not only themselves. They want that for the world. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness look around at the world, and they don't just want themselves to be in that righteousness. They want everyone to follow in that same path. But this imagery of hunger and thirst, it brings to mind not just like an inner desire, but a physiological response. Think about what happens when you get hungry and thirsty. There's, it's not just like an inner feeling that you have. There is pain involved in that. And you know that the longer it goes on, the worse it gets. Now, at first, yeah, you're hungry, you're thirsty. You know, it might be a little slight discomfort at the beginning, but the longer you go on, the worse that pain gets. And you know what it's like. Your mouth gets dry, and then it gets drier and drier, and and the stomach starts to gurgle, but then there's these pains that come. And if you're anything like me, you get a headache when you haven't been eating and drinking appropriately. And, and it just gets worse and worse and worse. And at a certain point, it doesn't matter what you're doing. All you can think about is getting food and getting water, getting nourishment. It consumes you. You can't function in life normally until you take care of those basic needs. And that's the way that it should be as we pursue righteousness in our lives. Like Just like we can't, we can't just stop eating and drinking and go about our life business as usual, we should not be able to continue on in unrepentant sin and go about life as usual. When there is known unrepentant in our sins, it should produce that kind of hunger and that thirst for righteousness, that our desire to repent, to be filled, that that we just can't function. It should consume us and disrupt our life until we eat and drink righteousness. You see, Christians cannot be satisfied with sin. Sin does not satisfy us. Righteousness satisfies us. And, that's, and that, this applies not just in our own lives, but in the world. As we think about how we relate to the world, we shouldn't have this attitude of, well, well I believe in marriage as God defines it, but other people don't, and that's fine. That's not fine. That's a big deal. We can't be like, well, I think God designs our gender, but as long as other people don't force their thoughts and their beliefs on me or on children, then it's okay. It's not okay. 
We can't just not care about these things. If we hunger and thirst for righteousness, then we care about these things. We, we Christians can't sit back and become desensitized and carefree about the world's embrace of evil so long as it doesn't infringe upon us. I mean, we act like we're, we're, we're sitting at a negotiating table with Satan. You know, and the thing is, he always comes. His first offer is he's, he's like, I want everything. And then we're like, oh, no, I'm not going to give you everything. But then we're like, well, uh, you can have this as long as I can keep this. And we're negotiating with him. And, and so it always comes out that Christians end up giving in little by little by little. Acting like, oh, it's not a big deal. It's okay. We get desensitized. We've seen it so much. It doesn't disgust us anymore. And we're negotiating with Satan. And that's not where we should be. We shouldn't forget how it even affects your life. Jesus said, you will be persecuted if you want to follow him. But think about how it affects them. The world is lost. And it hurts them. They embrace evil. And it hurts them. It destroys their lives. And that reality should give us pain in our chest. It should make us sick to our stomach. We, we can't force feed righteousness onto the world. That's not how it works. That's not what Jesus ever told us to do. And it's not effective. But... We have a serious problem if we would be content in a world that's free. Oh, well, I'm free to practice my faith and believe and, and to share my beliefs and everyone else is free and, and that's, that's all we want. Like, we have a serious problem if we're content and all we want is a free world that still rejects good and embraces evil. We do not hunger and thirst for freedom. We hunger and thirst for righteousness. So we need to get that straight. And we need to be careful because we can easily find ourselves satisfied when, when it's not righteousness in our own lives or in the world. And we kind of sit back and we relax. But we also need a follow-up to this one, which is the next one. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. This is a perfect, it's, it's like Jesus knew what he was doing. You know, this is the perfect follow-up to blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness because on one side, we can become calloused and carefree about sin. We become calloused. We, we, it loses, you know, you know the way it was. I mean, we just walk slowly like frogs being slowly boiled in water and we become desensitized to sin. We become calloused. It, it, it doesn't affect us anymore. But then on the other side, we can become calloused and insensitive to sinners. We might see the evil in the world and we lament. It hurts us. We hate it with a passion, which is the way that it should be. But we have to avoid the trap of letting those feelings draw us into becoming merciless tyrants who want to force feed righteousness onto the world and then cast aside anybody who rejects our hand. And that's not the way this is meant to be either. Whenever we begin to see ourselves as better than this broken world that spits in the face of God, we have to back up and remember that our eyes were only opened by the grace of God. If not for His mercy, we would be in the same boat. We would be thinking the same things, doing the same things. And, and, and we get caught up in, oh, these lies are worse than these. And, you know, Satan does not care which lie you believe. As long as you believe a lie, he doesn't care which one it is. But those who do not show mercy are not humble and have forgotten that they're spiritually poor. Yes, this depraved world needs to hear the truth. And part of that truth is like, hey, you have sin and it has broken your relationship with God. And if you don't repent, there is judgment. But the other part of that truth is like, hey, guess what? There's mercy. 
There's forgiveness for your sins, no matter how bad they are. No matter how we think of what you've done or who you are, there's forgiveness. And that helps us keep that balance. Verse 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. When pure in heart, some people translate as inner purity, which would be the most natural, and others have translated it as like a um, single-mindedness, as in there's no div- inner division of self. But the reality is those two go together anyway. If you are singularly devoted to following Jesus, then you will have inner purity. That's just the way it is. And then that inner purity is going to flow to outward purity. And this beatitude connects well with much of Jesus' teaching in the Sermon on the Mount because as we will see, he takes a grenade to hypocrisy and he teaches people that sin does not just come, it's not just what we do on the outside, but it comes from the inside. We sin in our minds, we sin in our hearts, and everything that we do on the outside actually flows through that vein. Verse 9 says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Divisiveness is very serious to God. So serious that Titus 3, 10, and 11 says, Warn a divisive person once, and then warn them a second time. After that, have nothing to do with them. You may be sure that such people are warped and sinful. They are self-condemned. That's some serious stuff. You know, divisiveness is one of those things that I think is often neglected. It doesn't get the attention and the discipline that it deserves. Because God wants peace among his people, and it is a grave thing to disturb that peace unless you have a very biblical reason to do so. However, what we see in this beatitude is not an admonition to be a non-divisive person, though that is certainly included in the umbrella, but being a peacemaker is not just to be someone who does not stir up trouble. It's great to not stir up trouble. You shouldn't do that. But being a peacemaker is more than that. It is active work. It's not a passive thing that you can just sit back and do. If someone tells you to be a car maker, they don't just mean don't go and wreck and destroy cars. They mean make cars. So you can't call yourself a peacemaker just because you don't stir up division any more than you can call yourself a car maker just because you don't wreck and destroy cars. But a lot of Christians have that in their heads. Peacemaking is hard work. But I'm telling you this morning that if you want to follow Jesus, it is work that you have been called to do. Just sitting around and minding your own business does not fulfill the job of peacemaking. When there is a fight among God's people, you need to get in the ring and break it up. And you need to be doing work outside the ring to make sure that that, try to make sure that that fight never happens in the first place. And what do you have to do? What must you do in order to fulfill this? Well, you got to be involved. Right? You, you, if you keep people, God's people at arm's length, that's going to keep you out of the peacemaking world. You have got to be involved. You've got to build relationships. You've got to be connected to people. That's all the more reason to be heavily, actively involved in your local church, to become a member of your church, to serve on committees, to go to business meetings. Because how are you going to be a peacemaker if you don't know what the conflict is, where it's coming from, or who's involved in it? You're not going to be. And being a peacemaker goes beyond the church as well. You are called to be a peacemaker in all aspects of life. At home, make peace. At work, make peace. In your neighborhood, make peace. In your city, make peace. Everywhere you go, be a peacemaker. And you know what that requires that you have to do? It means you have to be involved. Right? Sitting in a room by yourself is not you're not going to be a peacemaker. You have to stay connected. You have to build relationships with the people in your life. Be HR for your neighborhood, right? For your house, for your community, for your workplace. Maybe the people at work go to you instead of the boss or HR whenever there's a conflict because they know that you're going to take care of it a lot better. You're going to be a peacemaker. 
Now, you gotta, you got to do this work. You've been called to do this work. And I'm telling you that it's hard work. And it will take humility. It will take patience. It will take mercy. It will take prayer. And peacemaking is messy. But you've been called to do it. It is good work. It is godly work. It is kingdom work. And you shouldn't just sit back and neglect that. All right, you're not a peacemaker just because you're not a troublemaker. That's not how it works. Verse 10 through 12. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. You are blessed when they insult you and persecute you and falsely say every kind of evil against you because of me. Be glad and rejoice because your father, your reward is great in heaven. For that is how they persecuted the prophets who were before you. I'm not going to focus on persecution this morning because we've done that recently in our letter, in our seven churches of Revelation series. And I'm actually going to talk about that a little bit more in my next sermon where we're talking about being salt and light. It's going to connect here. But I do want to point out just how difficult all this is. This is not stuff that comes naturally to us. It doesn't come easy. It's not natural or easy to be poor in spirit or to mourn our sins or to be humble, to hunger and thirst for righteousness. You know, everything to be merciful. Like We know that our nature is completely the opposite of these things. To be a peacemaker to be pure in heart. And on top of how difficult it is to live that way to begin with, what Jesus tells us is that if you live that way, guess what's going to happen? You're going to be persecuted for it. Well, great. Okay. But what we must not forget is all the rest, right? We will be comforted. We will inherit the earth. We will be filled with righteousness. We will be shown mercy. We will see God. We will be called His children. The kingdom of heaven is ours. You see, embodying these attitudes in this world is a tough task. But just like we learned last week, we are able to do whatever Christ has called us to do. He provides what we need, not on our own strength, but through Him. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. But he doesn't just strengthen us. He set the example for us to follow. Trying to live these things out in this world is complicated because there are all these nuances in life. And there are these teachings of scripture that seem to pull us in different directions. And we get like, be merciful, but have nothing to do with a divisive person. Okay. Uh, Help the poor, but he who doesn't work shouldn't eat. Okay. Uh, Make peace. But preach a message that the world will hate you for. Uh, Okay. And we're like, how do we do this? But thankfully, Jesus came and he did it as a human being in this sinful world. And he showed us what it looks like. Now, we know he couldn't be poor in spirit because, well, you know, he's perfect. He's God. But he was humble. He was He wasn't spiritually poor like we are, but he did pray. He did rely on his connection with the Father. He did submit to the Father's will while he was here on earth. He mourned sin, not his own sin, obviously, but the sins of the world. We see that so clearly. Jesus was burdened by the sins in the world. He shed tears. He he sweated blood because of what sin had done to this world. He humbled himself by becoming like us and then humbled himself to die like a criminal. He hungered and thirsted for righteousness far beyond anything that we've experienced. In fact, he said in John 4.34, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Obviously, Jesus showed mercy to the world because we did nothing to deserve his sacrifice. And he was absolutely pure in heart, the perfect spotless lamb. And even though his coming and gospel does divide the world, and and at one point he said, I haven't come to bring peace, but to bring a sword and things like that. But he is the ultimate peacemaker. Like his gospel, his message is dividing, but ultimately he is the only one who can bring peace 
and restore the peace that was lost because of our sin, which is what he will do in eternity. And he was persecuted and killed for being the only righteous human to ever live. These attitudes that Jesus tells us to carry were carried by him. He led, he led by example. And he wants you to be blessed, which means he wants you to be in right standing with God. So are you willing to follow him into these blessings? Could these be attitudes that you carry as well? Like, are, are, will you reject the me attitudes of the world and instead embrace the be attitudes of Christ? I hope that you will. And I hope that you will meditate on these and, and, and pray that God will help you because we need help. None of this is natural. None of this is easy. But we can do it through Christ.